Welcome to another edition of the NCBI podcast. I'm June Tinsley, Head of Communications and Advocacy with NCBI. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Katie Abrams. Um, good afternoon, Katie, and thank you for joining us. Hi, June. Thanks for giving me a, the opportunity to chat to you today. It's lovely to hear from you. Great, great, great. Um, our chat today with Katie is going to centre around the um, importance of the Disability Awareness Month to coincide with that uh, and the whole issue of the fact that students with vision impairment are um, the lowest um, in representation amongst the uh, third level student population. But in general, we'll also be talking to Katie around uh, her own education experience um, and the, the good and the bad of it. So um, just to, to kick us off, Katie, if I can ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. So I'll start off with the kind of um, the diagnosis I have, I suppose. So um, I was born with a rare genetic disease called LCHAD. So that's the abbreviation LCHAD. I will spare you the long form of it. It's a really, really long um, disease name. Um, but basically it means that I cannot metabolize fat or lipids. So metabolize means use it for cell energy. So it's nothing to do with digestion. It's to do with using it for essential cell energy. Um, and fats and lipids are essentially the same thing. Um, so that includes dietary fat and body fat stores as well. And that's really important because fats and lipids um, represent long-term energy for your cells. So with the inability to metabolize the fats and use them for cell energy, it causes toxins to build up in our systems and that creates a number of health issues. So um, just to keep it relevant, I've lived with significant retinopathy um, muscle and nerve issues, low energy, that's kind of tied to the fact that we don't have a long-term energy source available to us. Um, and we have to follow a really strict diet, really low fat, um, very, very strict fasting times. Again, because we don't have any long-term energy source, we have to keep eating and drinking a lot throughout the day. And, and we can't fast for very long overnight. Um, and we have to take a lot of different prescription supplements to make up for the fact that our diets are so restricted. So for example, if you can't have fats, you can't get in enough fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K. Um, and even some of them can actually impact your eyesight. So we have to take a lot of specialized prescription supplements and medications. And also part of my disease, along with everything else, including the retinopathy, um, I was cheap fed for the first 11 years of my life. So um, just to bring it back to the retinopathy aspect, I suppose, usually what you can see with retinopathy um, is that it happens over a kind of a longer period of time with more well-known diseases like diabetes, type 1 and type 2. And they tend to, pre they tend to present a little bit, you know, sometimes quite late in life. But with LCHAD retinopathy, what we find that for those who develop it, it can often be seen when they are very young in examination, so infancy or very early childhood. Nice. So LCHAD, uh, as I said, is extremely rare. It's typically called an orphan illness or an orphan disease, like O-R-P-H-A-N, because we're just kind of singular right there, kind of alone. And because it's so rare, and I'm sure many of the people in your community and the visual impairment and blindness community will appreciate this, you know, a lot of these diseases that are genetic, because my disease is genetic, as I said, uh, it presents a lot of difficulties. Um, so LCHAD is rare and most of the patients are pediatric. The disease was only discovered in the late 1980s, I think 1988 or maybe 1989. I was born in 1990. I was extremely lucky to have been diagnosed with it because the mortality rate is extremely high if you're not caught early. Um, and because most of the, of the patients with it are still pediatric, it means that there's problems with uh, funding for research because not only is the disease rare, but most of the people are pediatric. So it's harder to recruit children um, not only with a rare, rare disease in terms of funding, but it's harder to recruit children for the testing that needs to be done to learn about Alzheimer's retinopathy. Yeah. Um, for example, you have to 
it's just kind of a necessity for the exams that they do for research purposes. Everything from the basic stuff like um, giving them the eye dilating drops. Um, I remember getting them all the time as a kid and I hated them because they sting your eyes and they knock you out of school for the rest of the day and they give you headaches. Um, but then there's the more advanced retinal testing that needs to be done for research purposes like the ERG. Um, and I do know that in the main research centers for L-child retinopathy, which tends to be in Finland and predominantly in the US, they often have to put children under general anaesthetic to get that test done, the ERG, um, which is more complicated for us because a lot of anaesthetics have are lipid-based or fat-based and we can't have them. So it creates a lot of different problems. So it's actually very difficult for us to get the research done to learn more about our rare type of retinopathy. And so ultimately it means that we have very little research about our type of retinopathy. Um, for altered retinopathy and uh, for all of those reasons. Um, however, our community internationally works really, really hard and we've fairly recently put funding together. I think it was funding done by parents of children over in predominantly in the States. And there's now big research going on over in the National Institute of Health in, in America to uh, do a couple of years long study, um, which is international. So I was actually invited to go over and do it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I can do that. It's a bit of a, tr a tricky thing to organise in terms of travelling with COVID, but um, hopefully things will improve. But it just kind of goes to show that after 30 years, it's still a very young disease, but there's just so little known about it. Yes. But that's kind of the background of, of my illness. And then in terms of my education, um, just... tell you a little bit. Sorry, go ahead, Jane. Just curious, because as you rightly say, it is quite a, a rare condition. So um, have you met or known other individuals in Ireland with the same condition? So I've, I've, I remember seeing another patient quite often in outpatients. So um, with LCHAD, it's, an, it's called an inherited metabolic disorder. So there's two hospitals that are the, um, like the official sites for us. One is Temple Street. Um, so I was there all the time as a kid, and I do remember seeing and kind of on and off chatting with the other kid who had LCHAD. There was only two of us in Ireland for most of my childhood. It's extremely rare. It was just us two. And since then, I I kind of vaguely remember being told that there was two more born with it around the age of about 10, 12, 13, maybe. Um, and now I think from what I gather from speaking with parents in Ireland who, who have children more recently diagnosed with it, I think the number is still really less than 10 in Ireland total. So it's very rare. So you, to be honest, most of the people I talk to with Alchad um, are online and they're closer to my age. And they are they are like one that I'm very close to was in New Zealand and there are a couple that I speak to over in the States and in the UK. Um, but it's very rare. I think the official I think the official number is like one in two hundred and fifty thousand or something like that. But it seems to be roughly one per million in diagnosed cases. Um, um or maybe a little bit more. I, I, I think there is less than ten in Ireland. I think it might be around six. But I, I don't have the data on that, but that's what I think it is now as of twenty twenty two. Oh, it definitely is very um, rare, as you say. And do you know if vision loss is a, a common component to the disease? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, with the, the lack of research. So I grew up always going to two departments, the metabolic outpatients in Temple Street, uh, where I meet with my geneticist and the nurses and the dietitian. And the other person that I was always going to from a really young age was my ophthalmologist, um, who was just an absolute star. So I was always linked in with those two. And I remember from a really early age going through eye testing. And probably from the age of about six, I remember really locking in on the ophthalmology and on the ophthalmo ophthalmology discussions that were being had with my parents when I was there in the room and discussions that my doctors were having with my parents over in the genetics department, talking about um, retinopathy and vision and that kind of thing. And I remember 
not really having a very sophisticated awareness of it because uh, understanding of it because I was a child. But I do remember thinking, well, I'm going here for eye testing every year. So they're obviously looking for something. And then as I got older, it just became very obvious that there was so little research. And the reason that I was being brought back to ophthalmology, you know, every six months to a year um, from from the time I was tiny, I think I think in early infancy, um, was because they knew that there was a potential issue with retinopathy back then, but we had so little data that the important thing was to monitor it and gather data and to feed that back out to the international community in an attempt to learn. And so, right up until the late twenty tens. You can actually look this up on the research. There is very little research. A lot of them are replications that they kind of link through back to the old, old, quite old research actually. Um, and there's case studies to be like anywhere between one and four young people with Valtad, and they would be used for retinopathy te- retinopathy research. And so that was kind of going on in the background. And by this time, I was linking in with the international community, and speaking with people my age and we were all kind of talking amongst each other, parents and children. And it did seem like most of us, once we hit a certain age, did develop retinopathy and we were all quite young. Um, Some people developed it very, very early on and it was quite severe. Other people seemed to have a much slower progression, but we were still young. Like we were all less than 18. So, Actually, it was the parents, and I think it was two particular wonderful parents over in the United States who really worked really hard with the National Institute of Health over in uh, America to try to help them um, acquire enough funding to do research to look properly into the retinopathy in El Chad. Because I think the NIH had tried to get funding. and it was a, There was problems getting fundi- funding again because I think the disease is so rare. Um. So anyway, the point is that now I think as of, I think 2021, there is a a new big research uh, project going on, which is going to last a couple of years and it's international. And hopefully from that, we'll be able to generate a much clearer picture of L-child retinopathy, because at the moment, we don't even really know why it happens. There's theories about why it happens. So do you remember how I said how, because we can't, metabolize fat yes. and the toxins build up in our system. One of the theories that's been out there for a long time is that the toxins build up and one of the areas that the toxins build up is at the back of the retina and that's what causes retinopathy. Right. Um, so that's one of the examples, but we don't know at what layer of the retina that it starts to happen with. We really don't know a whole lot. We know two things for sure, that for uh, people who have LCHAD, they are at risk of developing progressive retinopathy. And alongside the progressive retinopathy, you will have progressive myopia, which is progressive short-sightedness. Um, so they're the two things we definitely know. We've known them for a long time. But I'm really looking forward to the research coming out. I think it won't be for another couple of years um, over in OHSU, which is predominantly based over in Portland and Oregon. And I think there's another hospital out in Maryland and that's funded by the National Institute of Health and I do know that a huge amount of the international community are actually going out and being part of that so they're flying from places like Brazil, the UK, all across Australia um, to go and participate in that study, in that research to help generate the data that we need so that we can learn more about this rare form of retinopathy. Um, I think at this point it's looking like gene therapy is our best answer, to be honest, but it's important that we just know for the basics about it, like where in the retina does it start, um, what contributing factors might exacerbate it, because, for example, we can't fast very long. Um, People with our disease can be quite prone to being hospitalized, particularly in infancy, and there's, I mean, obviously we have a strict diet, so they're looking at the dietary component, they're looking at fasting, they're looking at hospitalizations, they're looking at all different things to try to help generate a much clearer picture about what causes the retinopathy. And then that will obviously be able to inform future treatment. 
because at the moment there's none. Um, so I hope that, answer, that answers your question. It's it's still really unclear because it's the nature of a really, really rare disease. And it's obviously constricted by funding. But I'm optimistic that in the next couple of years, we'll have a lot more data. And I know that there is a good team um, working on it at the moment. So hopefully the future will be a bit brighter for us. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. And, and hopefully that will materialize and help inform diagnosis and treatment to follow. Um, and I suppose, Katie, just to, to move on the conversation a little bit um, into your own experiences of the, the education system. I know you're presently a, a student in, in third level, but um, how supportive did you feel the education system was to you both during your school days uh, and within the third level sector? Yeah, so it's been a little bit varied. So I'll just kind of start off to talk about my background in a kind of a, a very briefly so at the moment, I'm a graduate student and I'm just waiting for the final processing of my degree, which is in the health sciences domain. So basically all that has to be done now is they kind of factor in the uh, credits that I've done, the modules that I've done, and hopefully then I'm out of there. Um, and previously, I did an undergraduate degree in Trinity in English studies, which I absolutely adored. Um, and in between those two, I did just under a year of postgraduate medicine and in between all those years I've been in employment so um so I've kind of you know spent I think actually a, a majority of my life actually learning I'm I just I love learning I really do believe that education uh is power and I'm I think I'm actually quite lucky that I I'm a naturally kind of curious person so I really I'm attracted to the idea of kind of being a student for life in, in kind of the uh, casual sense of the word. I don't think I'm not going to be able to have the money to kind of constantly go into um, education over and over again. But I always did say that if I won the lottery, I would just study and study and study and study because I just love learning. Um, so that's my education background. Yeah. Um, but in terms of uh, how supportive have I felt in education? So, well, I, to be honest, I had really like like so few issues in primary school. So bear in mind, uh, June, I had said earlier that I was nasogastrically tube fed. So that's a tube that runs, that's kind of um, taped across my cheek, goes into my nose, down my throat and into my stomach. So that's obviously a very obvious sign of a disability. Yeah. And um, so I, I think if there's any kind of benefit of that is that it leaves no scope for people to doubt what my needs are. And my primary school uh, was just absolutely fantastic. And a lot of my visual impairment issues, by comparison, were dwarfed by the fact that I was tube fed. And I was very young, in, you know, in junior and senior infants, I couldn't tell time. So the um, teachers had to set alarms on their phone to make sure that I was able to, you know, uh, take kind of um, feed, like special feed drinks I needed to take because I couldn't fast for very long. Um, but like they, they were just fantastic. So from a visual loss perspective, as a very young child, I don't remember ever being able to see in dim or dark light. Um, my parents told me that when I was tiny, I think the first time they brought me to the cinema, by this time I was already under the care of an, of an ophthalmologist, but they brought me to a cinema when I was really young and I turned to look at one of my parents who was talking to me at the time and, and they said, they said, Katie, Katie, look at me, look at me. And I said, I am looking at you, but I wasn't actually looking straight at them. I was looking around a blind spot or a scotoma. So I was actually looking away from them to the side and using my peripheral vision to kind of see them, if you mean, like if you get me. So those issues were always there from a really young age, but they didn't really affect me in primary school because they weren't shutting off the lights. So the the night blindness that I have wasn't really an issue in primary school. Yeah. Um, I did always also have depth perception problems. So, for example, when I learned to make tea or if I was pouring something or if I was sometimes in primary school, if I was being asked to kind of cut into like little felt toys, I would kind of have a little bit, I would have to learn to kind of tilt things certain ways so that they would not fall into my blind spot but I'd be able to cut them and maneuver things around. So I was always kind of adapting in primary school, 
but the way the primary school is, like I had written material, sorry, I'd, I'd font material, like the, the books that I was given had kind of clear font and you're only just learning to do handwriting. So there really wasn't a whole lot of barriers for me in primary school in terms of my vision. There was much more barriers um, outside of school, you know, in like getting around and trying to kind of navigate, getting around my house, for example, in the night, or what would I do if a classmate had a party in the cinema, um, which was a big thing in the 90s, you know, you'd take your whole class and all of your friends out to the cinema. Um, they were that was difficult because I'd have to have people to help me out of the cinema into the bathroom and that kind of thing. Um, and as my vision loss is progressive, um, because it's progressive retinopathy, you know, I had I've always had blind spots, and those blind spots have increased over time. Okay. Um, and I also had progressive short night short sightedness, as I, as I said before. So when I was in primary school, it was. It was a little bit easier to manage, to be honest, because as I got a little bit older, I was able to get prescription glasses that addressed the short sightedness. And then in terms of the blind spots, I was able to kind of learn ways to adapt how I did things. And sometimes it's actually quite subtle to other people, but it makes a big difference to me. So it's turning my head certain ways, positioning my hands in certain ways, um, sitting closer to the board. Um, and those kind of things, which are actually quite easy to do, but it's it's something that you just need to kind of learn to do yourself and then be able to communicate to teachers. So it was easy, actually, to kind of navigate primary school. And in secondary school, it was much the same. I went to two different secondary schools. Both of them were very good. Um, and then as you get older, there's more um, scope for um online resources because this was now going into the 2010s um sorry 2000 when did I go into secondary school 2009 I think 2009? no that was like that was college so this was this was about 10 years before that um but it was you know all of your learning material was in books and I'm still able to read clear font so as long as it's a white background and stark black font I'm able to read that fine. Bigger font is a problem for me because it spreads too far across the blind spots that I have. So I end up having to actually make things smaller and not bigger because once I make things smaller, I'm able to actually maneuver them so that they fall in, fall away from my blind spots into the areas that I have of acute vision. Um, so it wasn't really a problem for me in secondary school. And then in terms of the other aspects of my disease, Secondary school was very good. I was able to use lifts whenever I wanted. And uh, just like the culture, to be honest, in primary school and secondary school was really, really lovely. Um, and they were very open. And I think they had a couple of different students with different issues. And I, I, I really just can't speak highly enough about my primary and secondary school education. They were wonderfully accommodating. Obviously really wonderful. But he has that positive experience. So it's great to to hear that that was your experience. And it then sets you up. For, for life really and um your transition in, into third level then yeah completely I mean like I remember in I, I had such a wonderful um I think she was the guidance counselor I can't remember her exact name but she was the person I met first when I was because I moved to a um the institute of education when I was in fifth class sorry fifth year in secondary school so it's like a you kind of can move there for two years and I just remember her being so lovely and I remember her saying, you know, we have a really welcoming policy for students. If you ever feel tired or if you feel like your eyes are tired, if you want to take a break, we say to all of our students, go up, leave the class. You don't need to say anything to anyone. Go for a walk around the park and just kind of rest, you know, rest up. And I was like, I never actually had to do that. But I remember just being so struck about how kind it was. Um, I think that was kind of more geared to students who had a bit of anxiety or depression and that kind of thing, or who were a bit overwhelmed. But I just, I remember distinctly thinking that that was such a lovely thing to say. And it really speaks a lot about the culture that was there when I was in uh, primary school and secondary school, that it was just, you know, nothing's a problem. We're here to help you. You you can tell us what you need and we'll do everything we can to help you. It, it was really lovely, I have to say. And then when I moved into... Um, Third level, as I said, I did my undergraduate degree. It was a four-year undergraduate degree in English studies. Obviously, a lot of reading. Um, and I'm a huge poetry fan and 
classical literature fan and um, a theatre fan, particularly Shakespeare. So I was delighted to actually get to study that for four years. And um, by the time that I got into college, it was 2009. And I... Again, like everything was kind of moving forward. It, some people I remember using uh, handwritten notes in lectures, but um, the English studies program in in, uh, in my college was kind of old school. See, so like you'd go in, the lecturer would speak at the podium, and you'd be there taking notes. So there wasn't really a whole lot of um, what we'd now call blackboard posting of material. Um, but you also kind of were expected to go to the lectures and the tutorials because it affected your attendance. So. I would go there with my laptop. To be honest, I think most people did use their laptop at that time and took notes. So all of my notes were in uh, computerized format. It was fantastic. And, um, you know, the English studies program is very old school. So there's a lot of classical literature. And a lot of the classical literature is actually available for free online uh, on, on websites like Project Gutenberg, which I would actually really recommend to people with visual impairment or blindness because you can download them and... Um, use them on um, text to audio apps and that kind of thing. So it was great for me. It was a really accessible program and I really loved it. And that was four years. And I can't speak highly enough about the disability services because they were very cohesive um, with the academic staff. And I, I, I know it's not just for me. I and others felt that we could always go to the disability services um, and know that we would be welcomed with a you know a cheery smile, and it felt like people were very informed about different disability requirements and issues, and were very informed about what could be done. And I, they seemed to act very quickly, um, and, I, and there there did seem to be a genuine integration between the disability services and the academic staff, uh, which makes a huge difference. So I had a wonderful experience um, again starting out in college, and then I did. Um, two more uh, after that so like as I got older and I'm not sure we sometimes I think is it just that you, you know like over time do the system the system kind of face more burdens that we don't really know about I'm not really sure but it definitely became more of a mixed bag as I got older um and I'll try to kind of keep it succinct but what I will say is that I did learn um you know, like, say, for example, in my undergraduate degree, I, I was able to get extra time. I was able to go into my disability services and ask for my exams to move to a computerized room. Um, I was able to have complete transparency communicated to my academic staff. And they were really, really good about understanding my very explicit desire to be transparent because my disease is rare and it's complex. I've always felt very strongly that if you don't communicate it to everyone, it's going to lead to more problems. And they were very good about that. As I got older, I think the, the main issue that I got as I, as I went further into um, higher education, um, the main thing that I saw was that there was just a lack of cohesion between, uh, I'm just going to call them disability services. Some people call them different things, um, but it's just disability services. What I saw that there was a, like a genuine lack of cohesion between disability services, academic staff, and the student, and I think in a setup like that, it really leads to a lot of avoidable problems because, frankly, when that kind of cohesion is absent, there's a lot of extra barriers due to that setup and that kind of disconnect. And it means that not only is the onus placed predominantly on the students to, to try to orchestrate everything and everyone that needs to be involved, but to be honest, then you're back into dealing with emails and you're trying to deal with setting up appointments for different people. And sometimes I'd, I'd experienced reaching out to the relevant person, relevant people that needed to be involved in setting up reasonable accommodations and understanding my disability. And the, the opportunity to meet with them could be delayed for weeks or months. Um, and that kind of set up it really, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to cut you across there. Um, I'm just curious that, as you rightly say, if, if there is greater cohesion between disability services and academia and the student, <clears throat> it obviously improves the overall student experience of learning and their integration into college. Um, and um, as you rightly said at the beginning, 
people with sight loss and students with sight loss are amongst the lowest of individuals being represented in the um, third level population. And that seems to be the the remedy to resolve that is to have greater cohesion between disability services and academia and the student. Um, and would you say that um, there there is additional um, training needed or is there additional information needed or what do you feel is preventing that greater cohesion between all three elements? Well, I think because I came from, you know, I started off seeing that it can be done. Um, so, it, like, it's kind of hard. My understanding is that higher education institutes across, kind of across the board, do get training. Now, maybe it's a bit basic. Um, you know, I don't have any insight into that, but my understanding is that they do get training and, of course, they do get funding. But, you know, the, it can work, and I've seen that it does work. The majority of my time in education, it has been cohesive and it has worked honestly very seamlessly so um just to kind of give an example i think a lack of it i lack a genuine lack of awareness is a big issue now i'm not sure to what extent that can be resolved with training maybe the content of the training that's offered needs to be expanded to give more information um maybe the training that's offered needs to be kind of given by people with visual impairment so that it it really can be delivered by someone who kind of has an understanding and is able to deliver it in a special way. But just to kind of give an example of why I think there's a, a significant lack of awareness sometimes uh, in situations like this. Um, obviously a big part of what we need with visual impairment and blindness issues as students is reasonable accommodations. Um, and again, I've spoken to you about the risk of having a disconnect between the different services that need to be involved like I remember very clearly, this is not the first time it's happened, it's just one, so I'll just give you one example. I was quite forcibly told by a member of staff that I needed to try screen readers. And this was like this was in the absence of any computers being available and any font material being available for me to use this on. It was actually to do with handwriting. So, I mean, I've grown up with visual impairment and I know what I need. I I'm very lucky I don't need um, text-to-speech software yet. That would be probably the next thing I need, along with, you know, cane training and mobility training, but I'm not there yet. So I function completely optimally with computers. Um, and I have a bit of a delay because of the eyesight issues that I have, but there is, but I'm very grateful that it's just what I need. I need computers or really, really clear font, like, you know, white text or white background, clear black font. And, you know, I remember being told that told, and this was not a member of disability services, that I needed to try screen readers. And I was kind of asking, like, oh, I, I don't know how this would kind of work because my understanding is that screen readers need to be used on screens or kind of the appropriate format. And I never got an answer. And to be honest, I do feel like, and I think this is a risk that's facing, and I've learned this as I've over the last year, but I've spoken with more students with visual impairment who have had, a, I, I think actually, if probably at least more long-standing issues than I have. Um, I think there's a risk that when there's a lack of awareness in education, um, I think certain staff want to be able to just kind of, quote, tick a box and be able to say that they've offered something. But it's important that the actual needs are accepted rather than, so we need to basically be listened to rather than other, someone else interpreting themselves. Yeah, exactly. um, not necessarily not necessarily always out of malice, but they just need to be able to understand that we actually know what we need. And I think there is a concern across the board that we could be given um, inappropriate accommodations or inadequate accommodations. Um, and I know that I'm not, sorry, go ahead, Jean. Uh, was that the motivation for you to, to join the AHEAD Students with Disability Advisory Group? Yeah, a little bit. So I like, I mean, I've had, again, I've, I've been very lucky. Most of my education has been really, really good. But, you know, after a, a kind of a couple of years of finding it very difficult to advocate for myself and having very reasonable accommodations, and I mean reasonable accommodations that were actually listed as being approved and available according to Higher Education Institute resources, you know, they were being refused without really any clear explanation. 
uh, or consistent explanation, I did feel that it was important for me to, even just for my own kind of mental health, June, to kind of pick myself up. I was becoming more isolated. I was the only person in my class with a significant visual impairment. I, I think in all of my, um, I think in all of my, all of my education institutes, I've been the only one with significant visual impairment. Um, but it was important for me to seize upon an opportunity to kind of just use the time that I had to kind of reach out and um, speak with other people. So I actually had an email and I then did a little bit more research about the AHEAD Students with Disabilities Advisory Group. Yes. And I signed up to it. I kind of read a blurb about it and I thought, well, listen, I can do this. This is, you know, we meet online every month or so throughout the academic year. Um, AHEAD was set up by and for students. And its purpose is actually to inform policy and to work with stakeholders in education to try to improve things for all students with disabilities and to try to improve the amount of students who are actually entering into education, the accommodations that we get and our ability to actually pass through and finish education Um, and how to actually do also work with employment after that. So I applied for the, I remember distinctly, I applied at like half eight in the morning. I was having a cup of tea in bed and I was thinking I'm probably not going to get picked, but I'll just send my information in anyway, because I I wanted to do something that was positive to kind of pet myself up and to be able to kind of reach out to speak to other people. And yes, I, thankfully I was accepted into that group and it was just wonderful. It was sad at the same time, to be honest, Jean, because you know, I think I was one of about three people in the group who had um, visual impairment, but there was a lot of other students with different issues. And as difficult as it was to learn that I was certainly not alone in the in the difficulties that I've had over, say, the last, you know, up to, like up to a decade, like we'll kind of get that time frame in higher education. I wasn't the only one. And I was really upset to hear that some people have actually had this, these issues presented to them from a really young age. And I can't imagine how difficult that would have been for them because they'd never really been given a shot. Um, But the group was really, really fantastic. We met every month from about October of last year through to April of this year. And there were structured plans for each meeting, structured topics. We would talk about problems on the ground, problems that we'd faced from communicating with different students, everything from... um, the financial um, unaccessibility of student accommodations, from problems with recent accommodations, from problems with online resources being made available online for students to learn off of. Like bearing in mind we were in a kind of pandemic and a lot of colleges were um, kind of really needed to put up learning material online, which is a huge benefit for people with visual impairment as well as physical disabilities, but um, that affect their mobility. But it you know, it's certainly the way of the future. Um, but it was a really, really good learning experience and I was very grateful to be involved and I have made fantastic contacts through it. And um, yeah, that certainly was, I mean, certainly the difficulties that I've had more recently um, off the back of me knowing how easy we easily we can be accommodated with a positive attitude um, and a little bit more of organisation. Um, it was very, very helpful for me to link in with those other students to not feel alone and you kind of do get a collective sense of empowerment you know that we're all in it together it's not just us we're here in a little group what can we do and actually it was a segment of that group who um kind of broke out now and kind of decided to do a little bit more for disability awareness month in july so i I really would recommend that people kind of look into that and get involved i think the openings for places for the new academic year go up around october so you know, keep an eye out for, for anyone listening who's a student going into higher education. Um, and I think they get posted on the AHEAD website, the AHEAD social media and Coursera and a couple of other sites. But it's it was very it was really helpful. Like it really was. I think it's very important for students to link in with other students who have the same issues that they have so that you can come together, have your network, not feel alone and actually it just makes a huge difference, really, just to feel like you're not alone, to be honest with you. And I suppose that that's a very worthy point to, to conclude on is the fact that people um, are, are not alone. There are different supports and, and uh, helps out there. And 
peer support alone is just absolutely invaluable. Um, particularly in your instance, obviously, if you have such a, a rare condition, um, feeling isolated it can be quite common, I'd imagine. But it is a, an issue that's cropped up time and time again for <clears throat> other young people that we work with um, who are transitioning from school into college um, and trying to, to navigate that environment and have the confidence to self-advocate on what they need. All those kind of things are, are so important. Um, and as an organisation, certainly NCBI wants to support as many students as possible so that more students can and thrive in, in third level. Um, as you said yourself, Katie, you thoroughly enjoy learning um, and you, you thrive in that environment. Uh, so we certainly want to maximise that for, for as many students as possible. Yeah, no, and, no, and, it is, and I think that's the key thing. Like, you know, we, we can be accommodated. We're in 2022. To be honest, we're so reliant on computers and technology. People with visual impairment have been reliant on technology for so long. Like, you know, we've always known the value of it. Um, and there's, like, there's really no reason why we can't be participating more. I think, I think it comes down to just a lack of, a, a real lack of awareness. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, see visual impairment just on TV. And I think there's kind of two tropes that we really see often in the public, you know, like the um, musical geniuses, you know, like, uh, you know, who would be sitting at a piano and they're kind of almost like, you, you, know, you, know, they're, they're, you know, they're gifted, you know, they're, they're incredibly gifted. And that's not necessarily realistic. And then the, the complete opposite that we see is an older person sitting isolated in a chair with a cane or a Labrador. And really that's not what a lot of us are like. A lot of us are young with visual impairment and blindness. And I think it's about helping, helping people in the education system to realize that and helping them to understand that just because we're different, you know, none of us learn the same way. You know, you don't have to be disabled in any way. You don't have to have a visual impairment. We don't learn the same way. We all have different learning styles. And we just have a different learning style. And I, I'm very encouraged about the future, about what we can do in the future. And um, I, I do hope things can get better. And I think as time goes on, that there is more of an awareness about, you know, we should be included a, little, a, a bit more and we're very capable people. Um, and I do see a lot of motivation in the um, community of people with young people with visual impairments and blindness about how we we are aware of our rights and we want to be included a lot more. Um, so I am optimistic. Hopefully things will improve uh, over the next year or two. Well, I genuinely hope so, um, both in the, the area of research for your own particular condition, but um, also for, for students with disabilities right across the higher education institutes um, in Ireland, because it is so important that um, students can transition with ease from uh, the school system into to third level. Uh, if that's what they want to do so that they can uh, thrive uh, in the school, in, in the education system um, and beyond. But for now, Katie, I'd just like to say a huge thank you for your time and um, for your insights and your sharing your experiences. If anyone would like to um, avail of NCBI services or get more information about them, feel free to jump onto our website, ncbi.ie, or call the info line 1800 911 250. But for now, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Katie. Thanks, June. I really appreciate it.